Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hello everyone and welcome to Work in Progress, the personal productivity science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. Let's get started. I am your host, Tia Hama, and today I am joined by Dr. Wisnu Wiradani, a cognitive scientist specializing in media multitasking and information processing. In today's episode, we are talking about the paradox of multitasking and how it really affects our productivity. So let's get started. Hi, Wisnu. How are you? Good and uh, happy to be here. And how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for being here. So from what I've read, your profession is quite multifaceted and you've studied for many years. So for those who don't know you, do you mind explaining a bit about yourself and what it is you do? Yeah, so now I'm a, an assistant professor in psychology. So I work at a private university in Jakarta, Indonesia. I have been studying psychology over, I don't know, uh, 11, 12 years or something. So I started oh, wow. as, a, as a bachelor of psychology <laughs> uh, in Indonesia and got a master's degree and, and I did an exchange um, with Rasmus Mundus to the Netherlands, uh, oh, wow. I, where I finished my master's and then I yep. uh, got a PhD position there, which I did until 2019. So I graduated with a PhD in experimental psychology and cognitive science. Yeah. Mm. And then I work as, as a lecturer in the Netherlands, and then I, I was a postdoc also, and then I returned home for reasons. Uh, yeah, wow. And started working in uh, in Jakarta from 2020. So I've been, uh, I've I've been I've been working as an as an assistant professor since uh, mid 2020. So, what prompted your interest in psychology? I. Actually, so so as a, a bit of a personal story, so I wasn't actually planning to to go into university, but oh, okay. <laughs> but apparently uh, a school of my I, I I was in school, but and, and a counselor of my school, the, without me knowing it happened in Indonesia, she sent uh, an application on behalf of my name. <laughs> oh. <laughs> to different universities. I told my parents I didn't want to go to universities, but. Then they figured there is a letter coming that oh you want to get into universities because there is an uh, invitation to to get into a university and trans exam, <laughs> and then I thought that then I am going to university and some some other things happened. Uh, wow. Then I started studying psychology and apparently it was it was really fun and not only because we we learn about. Things that we can't see, uh, you know, tangibly mm. or with our senses, but also because people get creative when when uh, when studying things that we can't uh, we we can sense uh, yeah. d- directly with with our senses. So we go into experiments. So experimental psychology has uh, uh, has been my fascinations from the from the beginning. But there wasn't a lot of people who was doing experimental psychology in Indonesia, and I, I was lucky to have mentors that encouraged me to to get abroad because experimental psychology is very much alive there. And I went into a really good experimental psychology lab in Groningen, uh, the Netherlands, uh, where I learned not only how to do experiments, but also what are the things that are required to to do psychology decent psychological experiments yeah. <laughs> and yeah. because I'm, I'm really aware of the, the, uh, the nature of these kind of studies that we need equipments and, and things like mm. that. Um, so I pursue this, this, this kind of area that's, uh, uh, the, the topic is called open science these days. So I'm using open source softwares, uh, try to minimize things that we need to, to get licensed for 
Mm. And with that knowledge that I can bring back to Indonesia, wow. uh, I've been developing my own psychology, uh, experimental psychology lab over the last, I don't know, two and a half, three years. Oh, wow. And now that's we can impressive. do experiments here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's so interesting. I love that kind of, that decision was made for you, but it's sort of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind, like of, go along it's kind with of ended it. up being something. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for introducing yourself. We're going to get into some get to know the guest questions now. So this is essentially the part of the show where I ask Wisnu about himself and some more personal things. Uh, so I'm going to ask you four questions. Are you ready? Four questions. All right. Yeah. Ready. <laughs> so my first question is, what is a recent book you have read? Right. So uh, I mainly uh, read science fiction books uh okay. so uh hyperion um things like that but uh, recently my, uh, a very good friend of mine recommended me to to read 100 years of solitude so that's uh, what I've, i'm reading at oh, the moment wow. and i haven't finished yet it's it's very, very fascinating stories like multi-generational mm. uh people living in a really small secluded village and uh, things happen uh, that you know the world's happening around them but uh, you know there's there are things that are changing. There are things that stay the same. Oh, and it's, wow. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just really, really nice. Uh, I don't know, escape from what I do in daily life yeah. that, you know, requires rigidity and you know, <laughs> less creativity, doing things over and over again. Exactly. Yeah. Books serve as a great escape sometimes. Mm-hmm. So my second question is, uh, what is a movie that you would recommend? I would always recommend uh, Oh Brother Where I Do from the Coen Brothers. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just like that type of movie. I like the setting. Uh, I like the, the South American accent for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I like that, you know, things can be goofy and serious at the same time. I mm. try not to take myself too seriously. Uh, and, and, you know, most occasions, especially with my students, and that, uh, those kind of like perspectives that helps me. That, uh, you know, life can be, you know, a bit sad, but funny and exciting at the same time that, uh, you know, that, that kind of like a five that I get from mm. this, this time of movie. Yeah, exactly. No, definitely. We love, yeah, I, I really like just finding movies and books that aren't related to my work or my studies and you can just kind of escape and just kind of have a good time. And that's where, yeah, good comedy movies always come in handy. <laughs> Uh, so my third question is, who is your famous role model? I, I have a lot of role models. Uh, uh, unfortunately, in academia, uh, a lot of uh, my role models aren't famous yet. But <laughs> the one person that I can think of is Carl Sagan, the, the late Carl Sagan. Because, uh, you know, the more I'm, I, I get into academia, mm. the more I realize how important um, you know, science communication is. That that we 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 teach to a really fortunate uh, subset of the population who gets into higher education, and then we allow them to to actually get 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 this experience to 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 critically think about things, uh, answer questions structurally, and these are the mo- we always say in academia that these are the most important skills that that we want to impart to you, mm. and you will bring it. Uh, you know, uh, regardless of what type of work do you want to do outside of academia, like once you finish with with your higher education. But at the same time, we we, we teach really, you know, narrow and specific subset of the science. Yeah. And 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 knowing these these great people who 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 teach science to general population that that helps me to understand that. Uh, there are ways to communicate uh, science to a broader audience, and it, mm. it is an important thing to do. That you know, to, yeah, to, definitely to lessen the gap between uh, people that uh, that don't get into academia to to the things that we actually do. Mm. And it's essentially what the, the the things that we do in in academia really is answering really specific questions uh, in a really rigid manner, and then that's uh, once you know. Once people know that the, you know the equipments that we do, we use the procedures, the step, the instruments, I think it's, it mm. makes more sense. And I think it's 
it's going to be nice to to have more people engaged in in science in general. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think having science be more accessible, like you said, is is so rewarding for science by itself. Just to have multiple, um, yeah, perspectives and different backgrounds and kind of people having, um, yeah, different areas of expertise is is really helpful. Um, my final question is: What is a course that you have completed? So. Because you know, when when I graduated my uh, my PhD, I I tried to 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 tell myself I don't get into exams anymore. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's, that's that's the point in my life that that, that I'm, I get really happy with. So I have to say to you that uh, it's been a while since I, I I took a course, but the last course I took was I think it's an introduction to Python course. Oh wow! Uh, which which I took because it's not a requirement of my PhD, because, but we program mm. our experiments uh, using Python. So I thought, like you know, having yeah. a bit of a background knowledge there could help. Oh, that's so interesting. What is you said Python? Yeah. Yeah. What is so that's like a software that you use? Yeah, for it's like a programming, programming language. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Cool. Yeah. But definitely I agree with the no more exams. <laughs> Once, yeah, you no more exams. <laughs> Once you finish with your PhD, you get no yeah. more exams. My wife has a PhD as well. And I told her the same thing. Like, you know, you don't have to worry <laughs> about exams anymore after this. That, that. It's a great relief. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, relief. I concur. Um, so as I already mentioned today, we are discussing multitasking, the paradox yep. of multitasking and how it affects our productivity. But before yep. we talk about that, for our listeners, how would you define personal productivity? Right. So uh, in, in psychology, we, we, there is this area of studies called uh, human performance. And the idea is that we measure the optimal, uh, you know, behavior that, that we can uh, we can typically produce, and under under both typical circumstances and special mm -hmm. circumstances. And and you know, personally, from from my own uh, perspective, productivity just means uh, that I enjoy. I am in a flow of of the things that I'm I am doing. Mm. In a fl and in a flow means that that I can get really focused uh, on the tasks that I, that, that I have with me at hand. So that's, that's, that would be my personal definition. But if, we, if you look into a more scientific side of the definition, productivity just means the number of targets being achieved uh, with some kind of behavior over time. Yeah. It could be just really that simple. Yeah, yeah I think... And I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you go. <laughs> Yeah, I think that once we, we talk more about uh, multitasking, and I think uh, we can talk about a difference between productivity and accuracy, and I think that's really mm. important uh, towards yeah. uh, you know this this type of thinking. Oh, we need to do more stuff instead of like okay, take take a bit of uh, your time and think about your goal and you know how can you mm. structure this in a way that helps you achieve the goal, but not being super tired at the same time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think there's different different types of definitions of productivity depending on sort of how you look at it. Um, but I think from what I've learned from sort of hosting this show for, I think it's been a couple months now, <laughs> um, is, yeah, just like productivity is um, more about, yeah, the, the efforts that you put in and being able to appreciate kind of your um, capacity and, you know, avoiding multitasking, which yeah. is what we're going to talk about. But what yeah. do you think, um, what do you think people get wrong about personal productivity? Yeah, I, th I, th I think for the experience of doing things, it's uh, sometimes it, it doesn't, not not everything registers to our consciousness. That's something that we learn in psychology. Mm. That we think that once we wake up from uh, you, you know early in the morning, that everything registers to our consciousness. We are really conscious at all times. That we are experiencing things. Things are things that are great. Things are not so great. Mm. But you know, if, if we look into the, the the research about about consciousness. It's all the, the the things that register into con, into our conscious, just a fraction of the experience oh, wow. that, that 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 we do. Mm. So, but we cannot keep this kind of like illusion that 
we want to do all of these things. I'm, I'm alive. I, want, uh, I have this, uh, this drive, the, this motivation. I, I get to work. I do the things that I like. So I need to do more things. And that, that's, that's the thing. Uh, that's the part when I, where I think things get dangerous. That mm, we, yeah. we do things because of, you know, if you work in a company, even if you work in academia, there are targets. Uh, and then you do things just because, so you can do things. So this, this kind of like hustle culture uh, yeah. going on these days. Not because you have a certain goal, not because you enjoy it, not because you want to achieve some sense of mastery uh, in yourself. So just so that I don't look lazy, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. I spoke about this. Um, I had another show earlier today um, where we had, Thomas Edwards on, and he is, um, he specializes in kind of, uh, helping people, um, and like, you know, achieve goals, be productive and change their attitude and mindset towards certain things. And, um, we spoke about hustle culture and I wanted to ask you, but you, you've already answered my question was, um, yeah, this kind of hustle culture and this sort of, um, facade that it gives off that you're working really hard, but you're actually not it just looks like you're working really yeah. hard because it's not effective. Yeah. So over the course of your experience, how would you define multitasking in, in the context of productivity? Right. So, so I'll, I'll probably go, go, going to start with, with the very, uh, I don't know, more scientific definition of multitasking. So uh, multitasking is, is a term that's, uh, that's, that's, that's created for computers, really. And the idea of a computer is okay. that it has different threads, so mm. different cores. And you, you, you buy a computer these days, uh, they're, they're, they're always multi-core these days. And it means that each core can be responsible for independent tasks. So say that I am opening a browser and that browser is being processed by uh, with one single core, but I'm also opening, I don't know, an, a Microsoft Office. Uh, the, but the things that are being running in, in the browser is being taken care of a different core uh, to, to that, uh, who, that that takes care of the Microsoft Office yeah, running. Yeah. And in computers, you have this physical separation between cores. So uh, multitasking is really possible. So there are like things simultaneously running at the same time. But if you if you look into the human brain, we don't work exactly like computer. It's a good analogy though, yeah. and and there have, there have been like good scientific models coming out uh, just because we know how we understand how computers work, and to a certain extent, uh, these models are quite accurate, and it helps us to 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 describe, uh, to, to, to explain how the brain works. Mm. But it's a bit messier than that in, in the brain, that we don't have <laughs> yeah. independent cores. So in a sense, we don't multitask. We, don't, we are not able to, to process more than one thing simultaneously. At least at, uh, at the level uh, of behavior that, that we, we typically would say. For instance, um, uh, I wouldn't be able, we, uh, I think people in general wouldn't be able to say uh, typing uh, a manuscript while, I don't paying attention to, uh, to a news, uh, to, to the news article or some uh, news running in the background at the same yeah. time. What we do is switching back, uh, back and forth simultaneously, uh, frequently from, from one task to another. And that's... Oh, uh, and and because of the things that I that, that I mentioned really in the beginning, that not a lot of things are registered into our consciousness, mm. we subjectively feel that you know when we switch back and forth between you know, typing on a computer and watching a news, that it happens simultaneously, uh, whereas it's right, actually yeah. whereas it actually not. So oh. multitasking is you know. One, one, one debate. I don't know. I can, I can talk for really long. So you just please, <laughs> please, please stop me when, no, when, no, when it gets really, really interesting. <laughs> you know, when it gets really technical. I can get really technical on this. But, but so, but please, please stop me when it gets super technical. <laughs> but you know, we're, we're, uh, multitasking. Uh, one, one of the debates that's been going on in the research on multitasking is that mm. how we define a task. 
And recently, there's this yeah, this true. really great uh, great uh, experiment series of experiments mm. that I think uh, nail it quite quite nicely. And uh, uh, so there's this experiment from from uh, Iwasumoska from Jagiellonian University, and she defines a task into a means that you pursue to a means that you get into to pursue a goal. So yes. to, to define a task, you need a goal. You need something that you can you can achieve at a certain point of time. Say that, uh, I don't know, I'm writing a, an email. Uh, the goal is to, to get that email done. And yes. the... The means to get the uh, to get to get the email written is for me to get into a keyboard and type some letters. So there's this certain kind of like a series of activities, and I need to maybe think. I need to maybe open another document to to look into the things that I want to write into that email. Mm-hmm. I might need to to recall some some part of my memory and things like that. But that's 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 one chunk of your activity. A task is defined by a goal and a means to pursue that goal. So that that helps us to define multitasking as you, do you have different goals? If you don't have different goals, then it's not multitasking. Mm. Then then we get into this uh, this this point where I, where I talk about distraction. So yeah. say that you know you're typing a, a an email, you you're really into it, you're looking into another document, but a, a colleague is calling you. Yeah. And your attention gets to, uh, you know, answering maybe a, a really short question. Maybe maybe the colleague would just say hi, and, you know, how was your weekend, and so on. Uh, you answer that question. That's I would say that's not necessarily a task. You just being distracted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You've just been distracted. Interesting. Okay. Right. So how would is there is there a scientific definition for a distraction or not really? <laughs> it, it, there 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 is there is so so so. Uh, if, if you look into multitasking, you break uh, parts of it. One part of it is where you orient your attention to it. So there is mm. there is always this this attention part going on. That that again, please please stop me before I get too technical no, and, and this is too, great. Academ- <laughs> too, too academics. Uh, so a, a big part of multitasking is attention. And and if we mm. look into research on attention, uh, again, it subjectively feels like. Oh, we direct like you know directing this this mic so that it yeah, it gets to, to, it orients toward where my voice is coming from. Mm. But subjectively, it feels like that. But attention, uh, if you look into, see, I'm messing with the <laughs> mic again. <laughs> but attention, if you look into the brain activities, if if you look into the the kind of like mechanisms that that, that going uh, mm. behind the, the curtains, uh, is essentially. A combination of three separate systems. So there's the alerting system, so that that controls our arousal. So there, if there's some kind of changes in our environment, our uh, stress level. So that's that's a, that's a way to to think about arousal. Our stress yeah. level changes. We get our arousal increase. Uh, you can you can easily uh, perceive this by by the increase of a, of your heartbeat. Uh, if you look into your pupils, yeah, your pupils okay. might dilate. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like it gets you into this kind of like fight or flight uh, yeah, right. situation. So that's, yeah. that's the arousal. And that's part of the attention. Yeah. So if uh, say that you, you're working on something, uh, there's a change in the environment, namely a colleague is calling you, the noise level changes, then your, your arousal might increase. The second part of attention is the yeah. orienting, the orientation of attention. Yeah. And this is the part where you uh, where you orient your your sensors, uh, your eyes, your your ears, and so on, to where's the stimuli, uh, where the stimuli is coming from. Yeah. And this is a separate system, so that uh, sometimes it and it it if you're already aroused, it gets easy for you to to orient yourself toward the different things that are going on in your environment. Yeah. And then we call it distraction. Because you, this orienting system has an exogenous uh, uh, way of working. So exogenous means that uh, you can orient towards something that's externally changing. And mm. there is an endogenous part. And the, the yeah. endogenous part is where you control where do you want to orient your attention to. Yeah, okay. And distraction, that's, uh, if you get into this really technical definition of distraction, it's just 
that exogenous orienting of attention. Mm. There is something changes in your environment. Uh, if that something is really novel, that that uh, you know it uh, it's really has a high contrast towards the rest of the environment. Say that you're working in a really quiet room, and suddenly the the door is open, then you would automatically get your attention, the orient your yeah. attention towards it. It's, yeah. it. It can't be helped. It's the way we survive <laughs> all yeah, of these exactly. million of years. And the yeah. last part of attention is the ex- we call it executive uh, uh, attention or inhibition. Mm-hmm. This is where you decide whether you want to deal with the distraction or you want to keep going with your task. Yeah. So these three, the, these three events, uh, you know, the, the the rising of your arousal, the orienting of your systems toward where the stimuli is coming from, and the, the deciding on whether you want to inhibit uh, this distraction or, or or do you want to reorient your attention. Mm. Uh, these three things happen can be perceived to be simultaneous. Although, if you look into, you know, the propagation of information that's going yep. on in your brain, it, it happens in, in different time points, at different time wow. points. Wow. That's so fascinating. <laughs> that's a, Yeah, because I think it looks so, yeah, like simultaneous on a surface level, but there's actually so many different components that are happening yeah. kind of one after the other. So going back to um, my questions in terms, you brought up, like we talked about distractions and multitasking is something that we see a lot kind of, you know, looks like it's occurring on a consistent basis. But like you said, it's just changing that sort of like perspective back and forth. Um, In terms of situations where people, for example, are learning, such as like in a classroom where you have multiple students who are trying to write down notes and listen to the lecture and, you know, maybe talk to their friend or, you know, they're playing with their hair or something like that. Um, In those kind of circumstances, multitasking looks like it needs to be occurring. So what advice do you have for people um, uh, like trying to, you know, administer these kind of situations? For example, like teachers who are trying to keep students engaged while also trying to keep them learning, writing things like, you know, you have, you've done lectures. Yeah. How do you feel like the classroom should operate to be productive? Right. So, so the, the funny thing about our, our, our sensory systems is that it can uh, get occupied. The more it gets occupied, the less that you can get distracted. And that's, that's because you, you have this kind of like, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe you have a series of jars if and say that the distraction is coming from another jar of water, but if all the jars are full, it can't go into into none of the jars that we're having. Right. So okay. the idea is that if we keep uh, students occupied, um, I don't know, ideally with, uh, with them being engaged in the lectures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, then it's getting harder. It 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 would be harder for them to get distracted. Because huh, they're orienting their systems towards something specific. Yeah. But of course, you know, even the most engaging teachers can't uh, get their, their students engaged all the time. And mm. this is where, the, you know, the, the endogenous control of attention that I, uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier uh, come about. That if there, there's this kind of like, you know... Uh, Part of the attention is is, uh, is tightly with uh, with our self control, and if you came again uh, with multitasking, the idea being that there is a goal, there there is a means to to pursue a goal. If your idea is into coming into class is that I want to absorb as much knowledge as possible, then it's easy for these type of students to to you know maybe at this point of time I'm not engaging with the lectures, but I'm thinking about, you know, how would I study this this afternoon? Or yeah. maybe uh, I, I didn't hear the lecture really clearly. So I asked my friend, like, you know, uh, is my, was he saying something like this? Or, mm. you know, just, just confirming uh, even with the lecture. So that's, all, that's something that I always uh, do with my students. Like, I, I will wait. I will ask them, like, do you, do you have questions? If you don't have questions, do you want to clarify some points? Because maybe you think about things that they're really, really related to, to what, what we are talking about at the moment. And yeah. you think it's going to be interesting. And that's, uh, this could be related. This could be 
could be not, and then uh, we can clarify things together. Hmm. But of course, not not all students are are coming to to you know absorb as much knowledge as possible, yeah. and a lot of them are. Uh, I have to say, uh, especially if you teach at private universities, uh, maybe anecdotally speaking as well. Uh, I shouldn't stereotype. Uh, I shouldn't be <laughs> uh, be stereotypical towards students. But I have to I have to say it because I'm I'm also mm. uh, collaborating a lot with uh, with educational scientists that we know yeah. for a fact that. Uh, a good portion of students that are not c- coming into classroom to, to to absorb as much knowledge as possible. They yeah. they come to 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 you know get get enough so that they can pass the exam. But yeah. my argument for these type of students is also that even for these type of students, that getting a bit of the knowledge in and getting focus and getting uh, you know effectively absorb information. Is helpful because mm. then they can use the rest of their time, you know, playing games and uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, uh, going to to to, to places uh, with with their friends because we can go to places again these days. It's it's hey. really it's really <laughs> nice. Yay! Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, my my tips for them is uh, for for the students going back is that uh, think about what what do you want to do, what what are your goals, and mm. this could be a really short term goal. This could be uh, a midterm goal. Uh, I don't know. I want to pass this, uh, this kind of exam. It could be a long-term goal. That uh, what do I want to do after I graduate? Yeah. But once you have these goals, it's it's easier for you to determine what kind of means which you need to help you reach these goals. Mm-hmm. And this could be something that's related to education. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't really mind if my students are goofing around in my class <laughs> because. I am not expecting all of them to become scientists. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but exactly. What do I do expect from my students is that they they get curious, they get they get into this kind of like critical thinking mode that mm. they question things. They yeah. They 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 get they they get some interest spark. I don't know. It it doesn't have to be in my lectures. It could be somewhere else. But you know that. Look into the things that you want to do. Once you have goal, it becomes easier for you to determine what do you need, uh, what are the, the the environment, what are the friends, uh, what are uh, the requirements, uh, what kind of the skills that you need to to, yeah. to reach that that goal. Interesting. So you mentioned before, um, kind of having engaging professors and all that kind of thing. Does someone need to be interested? in you know the stimuli for it to for them to maintain engagement because obviously you know you hear a lot and I'm currently studying um I'm at law school at the moment Ooh. and a lot of the time I am not <laughs> that's a lot interested. of reading if I'm correct yeah. right <laughs> it's a lot of yeah. reading yeah. and a lot of the time I'm not really interested in the content but I have to learn it and stay engaged do you have do you think um you know from your personal experience does someone have to be interested for them to maintain engagement? Yeah. Uh, having some kind of interest helps, but I, I would say you don't necessarily need to be interested because uh, what, what's, what's really nice about goals is that you can set up a really short-term goal, uh, a really uh, a mid-term goal, and, um, mm. and, uh, and, and a long-term goal. And I would say that if you're not, you might not be interested in this particular course, but you are interested probably to to get to know into I don't know I I, I don't know a lot about loss but say that <laughs> That's I have to go back yeah, into, into into psychology <laughs> so say that uh, I teach biopsychology and experimental psychology hmm. and both are really difficult and boring classes but say that you are interested in neuroscience you you kind of need to know how the experiments are set up. And yeah. you need to learn that through by uh, experimental psychology. You need to to learn how about different anatomies and how they operate in, in synchrony with one another. And then you need to learn it in, through biopsychology. So maybe mm. you're not interested in that particular thing, that particular book, but you're inter- you can broaden your interest and yeah. find something that, that you can relate to your goal. And I think that would be really helpful once you f- mm. you figure out okay. 
I'm I'm not interested in particular to this to this book, <laughs> but yeah. I have in my I don't know long term goal to be I don't know a neurosurgeon or a neuroscientist. Well, you can yeah. be a neurosurgeon with psychology. Say that you want to be a neuroscientist, <laughs> yeah, and then you kind of get kind of have to pass through this phase uh, to help you get there at some point. Interesting, that's great. Yeah, I like that. That's great advice. So. Um, there is this false notion that multitasking is a sign of productivity, which is what we've spoken about. But yeah. as you mentioned, it's clearly not, and it's actually due to poor focus on simultaneous tasks. Um, so why do you think people um, should opt not to multitask and what benefits does not multitasking yield? Okay, so... I, I think to, to answer this, I need to go back to this distinction between multitasking and getting distracted mm. again. And the idea of multitasking is that say that you have, you know, the course of your of, of my day, uh, I need to, I don't know, answer an email from a student. I need to attend to, to a meeting online. I need to, I don't know, grade some papers and so on. I can either do one of those things or one, uh, these things one at a time, or I can try to do to to kind of like interleave uh, some of them. And the idea is that if the goal is to be productive, then I think most people would benefit uh, just to try to do one thing at a time. Uh, but if you don't want to get bored, and that this is this is where it gets interesting. Yeah. So, so our, our attention it uh, it waxes and wanes. Uh, you can get in, uh, get really focused into into something, but at some point of time you get tired. Uh, and this is the difference between this kind of like this orienting of attention system that helps you focus into into the thing that you do, mm. uh, with the arousal system. And the arousal system it, it 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 wants to 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 maintain the balance. This is the same system that that also regulates our hunger, for instance, and okay, heartbeats, yeah. and you, you know things that gets into you know homeostasis and mm. uh, our core temperature, for instance. It ne- it wants to always go back to the baseline. So the idea is that when 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 you tr- start working on things, you, you get it, you get your or- orienting of attention working, you get really focused. But at some point of time, your body needs to get return to a certain balance. Yeah. And this is where, you know, uh, things that we perceive as boredom come to light. So uh, the, the, these days, what I'm, what I'm trying to do with multitasking is it's try to, uh, to figure out how these systems work into, uh, uh, with one another and, and figure out, you know, as you said, when multitasking can be productive and when multitasking can be when it's not multitasking, they say that you know you have multiple goals, but you're just getting distracted because you're bored, and it's it's and it gets uh, it's easy to get distracted when actually uh, you know when you reach into a level where your orienting system can't help you anymore, uh, focus <laughs> yeah. into a certain task. So uh, a more neutral way to look into multitasking is that it, it's it's some kind of paradox that. Uh, we know that it's not productive. We know the cost. We are aware of the cost. But I think, in general, we will just do it anyway. Because if we, yeah. we try to do <laughs> one thing at a time always, uh, we get bored really easily. We, yeah. uh, we, then get, uh, we don't get aroused enough. So I would advocate for, you know, if you can plan ahead, plan ahead. You know your days in, uh, in advance say that the, I have to, sometimes you have to attend this kind of like boring online meetings and you know you don't have to pay fully at, your full attention towards it, <laughs> then yeah. okay, then I'll just connect to the audio, I'll, I'll listen every now and then, but I'm just going to do something else. And yeah. that, uh, what people, well, what most, pe- most people would consider that as multitasking. And I would, uh, you know, even though I'm a researcher in multitasking, I would, I would accept that, that, that as an example of, you know, so-called productive multitasking. Mm. Uh, because the, this attention system, again, there's this inhibition of attention. When things get really, really uh, crucial, there's a, a huge change. If your name is called, then yeah. 
you can actually focus on something else and then uh, when your name is called, quickly get your orient- or orient your attention towards it. And it's, this has been researched really extensively back in the 70s. You get into this kind of headphones. It's called dichotic listening. So okay. you, you listen to, uh, to a message from, from one ear and then there's another message coming from the other ear. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So... So, and the idea, the experiments would at, ask you to attend, say, to your left ear, but every now and then would call your name from the right ear. And apparently, you can, uh, at the end of the experiments, uh, you can test the participants, like, what, what are being told that towards your right ear? And then they can, for certain type of stimuli, your name, uh, you know, something that's really uh, relevant to your goals. Again, goals are important. Okay, yeah. Uh, those things uh, can can be attended even though you are doing something else. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So now that we've kind of had a good sort of overview of multitasking, um, what would you say are your top three tips regarding how one can overcome multitasking? Because obviously it's something that we try to do, but would you say that, we're trying to multitask so that we don't get bored? Like, is that kind of like we're trying to have like multiple things going on so that we can switch so that we don't get bored with one? Is that kind of what, is that kind yeah. of what that is? <laughs> is that yeah, sort yeah, of what yeah. it yeah, looks so, like? So yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's uh, I don't know, I, I, uh, these days, uh, uh, the more I, I do research on multitasking, the more I look at it into something that is uh, uh, unavoidable. Because uh, if it is actually not part of our, uh, not part of our, uh, our you know, behavior routine, people would just get, uh, you know, do things one at a time from a from really long time. But uh, the fact that if we, if, we, if we observe people's behavior, it's not the case. So there is a need to multitask. And boredom, uh, you know, avoiding boredom is, is one of the answers to that. Mm. But I... I don't know. I uh, I I still think that there there are more to it. Uh, Interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so my my three tips would be that first plan ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you can, uh, always plan ahead. If you know your, your what your day looks like, uh, you can already. Uh, I I I I do checklists. Um, at the uh, first thing I do in the morning is to make a checklist of things that I need to do in that day. Uh, I tend to do. The, I tend so so there are easy things to do. Then I tend I tend to spread them around. So mm. I would do several easy things in the morning, and then I would get uh, get focus and do, do some of the difficult things that I really like. And then uh, uh, I want to end the day with another set of easy things. Yeah. So that, that helps. Uh, anecdotally, it helps me. Interesting. Uh, the second would be to I don't know use. Uh, we have technology these days, uh, calendars and things like that. Calendars help me a lot. So mm. my second tips would be to just use technology if you cannot plan ahead. So uh, to, to avoid just attending into the multiple things simultaneously. So I figure, I figure out uh, recently that uh, I, I use Windows uh, computers and you can have multiple desktops. That's really mm. new for me. Yeah. So you can have your email and you know uh, and whatnot the things that regularly you need to, to you need to monitor open in one desktop and then you can open another desktop and you know when I, I need to write a paper I'm just gonna open another desktop and then I open my library of papers then I need to, to look I open like a statistical statistical program that I use but I don't have to look uh, to monitor my emails because that's just going on into the other desktop. <laughs> and yeah. Thanks. Thanks to computers, they have multiple threads. Things are just going going on in the background. Yeah. So so there there are things like that that uh, that we can use to to help us avoid being distracted. Uh, mm. More recent studies, uh, I think, from a really uh, good colleague of mine, uh, Jesper Ogert from from Denmark, is that students. Uh, they 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 actually aware when they got distracted. So a lot of these students they also install productivity apps. So so I have an app installed so that I cannot open emails outside of working hours. So right. because wow, yeah. sometimes it's habitual and then like yeah. okay then I'm gonna I'm gonna check my emails. <laughs> I but, do it too. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently a lot of students do that as well. They have reminders for their courses. They have 
uh, uh, things to block their social media. Uh, they they have timers. There's this Pomodoro techniques. Uh, I'm yeah. collaborating with some group of educational scientists who are we're doing research on that. Uh, apparently, it's quite effective. Yeah. So, so I use it. I hope it's effective. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I, I do so, it. <laughs> so yeah, we 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 compare this to like 25 minutes, uh, uh, 25 minutes, uh, 20 20 minutes of studying and five minute breaks. We had 12 minutes of studying with three minute breaks. Apparently, the the, the 12 minutes is too short. And we also okay. compared with a condition uh, where students can just do whatever they want. So they 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 define it uh, uh, their their study hours by themselves. Uh, at least the Pomodoro technique is is mm. somewhat better than uh, than this kind of like self regulated technique yeah. of just do whatever you want. Yeah, kind of that's so interesting. I yeah. have been doing the the Pomodoro technique recently because I've got some papers that are due <laughs> um, recently, so I'm happy to make sure I get them done. And um, it's so interesting because when I I set the timer um, for I try I try to do thirty minutes and then take ten minute break. Um, but every single time I will lose focus at about the exact same moment and I will like check the timer to see how much longer. <laughs> how much longer exactly, yeah. pretty much exactly every single time it says I've got 12 minutes like more. So oh, I don't no. last like the full, I tend to get, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't do the math. But um, yeah, I'd only, I tend to only get so far. I think it gets yeah. to like 20 minutes and then I, and then I've, and then I lose it. So I try to push through the extra 12 minutes to get the yeah. full, the full 30 minutes done and then take, but it's so interesting every single time I get like, I lose focus like yeah. at the exact same moment. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because I have lectures at the moment um, at my law school, they go for three hours. Oh my. And I'm just like, if I can't concentrate for 15 minutes, <laughs> I don't know how I'm supposed yeah, to it's, it's, sit through a three-hour lecture. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 crazy with these lectures, right? That's that's mm. um so this semester, like the, the beginning of the next semester, I also need to teach uh four times fifty minutes. And I thought, like, no, the students can't last that long. I can't last that long. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. what, I, what I do during my lecture is that I typically have a two, two times 15 minutes lecture or three times 15 minutes lecture. Is to, so this is my third t- uh, tips actually, okay. uh, <laughs> is to take a break. So that's, uh, yeah. it's, uh, we, have, we are doing research on that and we know that they are really, really effective. So our, uh, I mentioned earlier that there's this kind of like waxing and waning, this homeostasis mm-hmm. system that we kind of need to get back into the baseline at yep. some point and the breaks allow us to to actually go into the baseline uh you know really structured and really you know system, systematic manner so it, it helps our body regulate itself like things are really busy so uh you know when you get engaged uh, there's o- only you can only get engaged so much even even to 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 things that you're really interested in so the 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 most fun part of my job is to analyze data, and I really like it a lot. But even even I, if I have to do that for I don't know two hours continuously, I I'll I'll make mistakes, and I'll uh, you know I, I I'll get aware, I'll become aware mm. of the point in which uh, I started to make silly mistakes. So yeah. <laughs> so so you do need breaks, and. Mm. And this this can be systematic. This this can be something that you set by yourself. This can yeah. be something that you agree uh, with with I don't know whoever it is that you're working with. with if a student, then there's something with a lecture. Uh, I I always make uh, make breaks in, in my lectures, and I always tell my students that you know at the beginning of a course, the the lecturer is always asking you. Uh, what do we we want to agree on this lectures? And I would always advocate tell this lecture to have a break. In, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, me too. <laughs> in in uh, in, uh, in between the courses. And another thing that are uh, uh, that that some, some somewhat relate to your experience is that we know that there is individual differences. So mm. uh, some people can maintain their focus of attention longer than others. Uh, I think, you know, if we we look into this kind of like observational studies where students are learning or reading things or, I don't know, doing their homework or something, and then they get uh, monitored or they're wearing an eye tracker and then you can can see what they're doing. Uh, 
it's actually really bleak that our focus of attention is uh, this the attention span these days is, is mm. the I think the best estimate is three minutes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, but but of course, and the, 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 this is considering that you know when after three minutes they say that the, a student is opening a browser to check you know, social media uh, streams yeah. or something, or check an email or take a break or get uh, get a drink or something. But but it's it's three, it's three minutes. And uh, some if uh, there are like these observational studies between television and something, and that's the things happens in seconds, in matter of seconds. So what I get from those studies is that you know. First of all, uh, our brain is really good at maintaining this kind of like a stream of consciousness mm-hmm. that we we think that we feel like we're doing one continuous thing, whereas we actually you know, switch between uh, between tasks really often, really frequently in between. Yeah. And then we felt like, yeah, I've been doing these things for, for two hours uh, straight. But like, if, if you look into the, the, the lock, book, <laughs> if you look into the, the eye movements and like, it's not, it's not going to be true. Yeah. So, so to, to, again, breaks that, that, uh, this individual differences, like some people take, uh, can, can maintain uh, their focus a bit longer than others. Mm. But I think what's, what's, be, what's pretty common for, uh, a lot of uh, our participants in multitasking studies is that people tend to overestimate their their ability to multitask. So yeah. they, uh, you know, uh, they feel like, and the, the the irony is that people who overestimate their abilities the most are actually the worst at multitasking. <laughs> so if we do st- studies like you know uh, how good are you, and yeah. then we actually put them in a lab. Okay, you do this thing, and and you know there's going to be another thing that's uh, that you need to do. They, they actually perform the worst compared to uh, to people who said like, yeah, I'm actually yeah. pretty okay or actually pretty bad in multitasking. Yeah. So we've now come to the part of the show where I'm going to ask Dr. Wisnu about what he does um, to deal with multiple tasks that is not necessarily multitasking. Yeah. Um, but this is, yeah, essentially where we find out what the experts do. So what is a practice that you do to deal with an abundant amount of tasks without necessarily multitasking? Right. So, so I, I try to, to practice what I preach. So I, I tell people to plan ahead. So I, I try to do that. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I keep my calendar really. Uh, I try to keep it as neatly as possible. I know, you know, in academia, there are a lot of things that, uh, there, that we need to do. But some of these things I tend to like more than others. So yeah. I, I like research more than, uh, I don't know, teaching. And we also have to do outreach here. So this is a great opportunity, actually. I'm going to count this as one of my outreach points. Um, so what I do is to make sure that I can block at least one day a week to, mm. to do this because it's part of the job as well. So I, 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 I block a day in a week where I will ex- exclusively just do anything that's related to research. Most of the time it's writing. Sometimes it's data analysis. Sometimes it's having meetings with the collaborators from abroad, uh, which can happen in really weird hours. And then on these days, I can be a bit more flexible than others. So for the rest of the day, I try to keep it, uh, I try to block my schedule that I need to do before something else is going on as well. So I teach, for instance, if I'm teaching on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, then I'll block sometimes on Monday, so that I know that I have some time to prepare uh, to, to prepare for my my lectures. So that's ah, that's something okay. I tend to do as well. So it's like time blocking. Is that yeah. kind of what it is? Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. So what would you say are three good things about this practice? So first of all, it helps me to not get stressed too much because I know that uh, I can anticipate what what would happen uh, mm. ahead of time. Uh, the second is that it helps me to to avoid distractions or I can easier it's easier for me to say no to things and in in my profession we have to say no for a lot of things yeah. Uh, you know, students can come outside the office hours, and they they, they might want to get your your personal. Uh, you know, you want they want to contact you personally. Uh, that's something that I, I I schedule as well ahead of time. So I have this kind mm. of like students office hours if they need to 
to to see me for for uh, university related things, they can they can reach me out on this particular time at this particular week, and they can they can reach me out through other means as well. Uh, and the third thing is that it creates it helps me create a good habit. It mean uh, because if I do if we do things regularly, whatever that thing is, it it becomes a habit at some point. And the thing about habit is that it requires less effort. And that's that's really uh, that that this is really nice because then uh, less effort for doing a thing means you have more effort to do other things that you might like better, like I don't know, baking a bread, um, yeah, <laughs> you know your yeah. hobbies and so on. So uh, so yeah. if, if 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 you schedule your 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 life habit, of course it it helps me, but I don't know, uh, you know, you have to find your own rhythm, and it takes a while. When I find, yeah. uh, when I move to a different environment, I move to a different country, uh, I move to a different university. People have different paces. Uh, you have a di- you have different ways of thinking about what what counts as productivity, and you know what counts as working and so on. So, kind of like need to adapt to that as well. But for me, what works mm-hmm. is to just get really, I don't know, somewhat rigid and, and determining. Uh, what kind of time that I want to allocate for work and what kind of time that I want to allocate for my own life. So this kind of like work-life balance happening. Yeah. Interesting. So what, um, if there are any challenges when you do this practice? Uh, sometimes you just need to, to to let go of the things that uh, on your calendar say that, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's yeah, a sudden yeah. meeting and there's a student needs uh, needs your help and like getting into a deadline. Of course, you need to be a bit flexible. So, yeah. so the challenge is that sometimes it can get less flexible uh, with this kind of practice that you, you have. You, you plan things ahead. You're less stressed because... Uh, because you know what's going to happen, you can anticipate. But at the same time, you there's kind of like different stressor coming from the things that you need to let go if, uh, you know, an urgent uh, thing coming up. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. I think I face that too. That's my biggest problem when it comes to um, like blocking out times for studying or work or life chores, etc. is sometimes things come up as they often do during the week and I have to be more flexible and so I get disappointed because I'm like oh no I had this like great plan and now I have to like ditch it for something else which is why I've um yeah I've kind of backed off the blocking I just sort of put in um get a sort of more more general goals but I don't know if that's helping (laughs) I'll I'll see how it goes (laughs) so um, do you set up a particular time to kind of sit down and block out your calendar or do you just kind of do it as tasks come? So uh, the, the, the good thing about academia is that at the beginning of each semester, we kind of know uh, at which day we have to teach. So then mm. you can block your calendar ahead of time. So that's what I tend yeah. to do. Uh, and this, again, helps me because... It's it's uh, I I used to work in the Netherlands and everyone has their own calendar. It can be really rigid and if, you you know coffee meeting can uh, you you need to schedule that like months ahead of time. But yeah. here in Indonesia, <laughs> people are more relaxed. And, you know, sudden yeah. meetings can happen. Uh, so I I try to get in between those kind of like I don't want to get it too too rigid. Like people can, should be able to to get into coffee. I should be able to get into coffee with people as well. But mm. at the same time, I don't want to to suddenly say that the colleague said, "Well, we're going to have a meeting now." And now it's not going to happen. It's, it's <laughs> I, yeah. I have things on, <laughs> I have things on my schedule. So yeah, yeah, interesting. So how do you think this practice impacts your personal productivity? It it keeps me sane. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I, don't good. Know, I, was, I don't know how else I, I, I can the say that. Minimum. <laughs> the minimum. That, that in academia, we need, uh, it's, it's a lot of pressure, right, in, in academia. So we need to do research, we need to teach, we need to do outreach. There are tons of, you know, paperwork coming, grading, mm. uh, things like that. So if, if I deal uh, with these tasks one thing at a time, it, it's very easy for me to get you know overwhelmed because then I'm just gonna keep uh, I'm just keeping up with with my to do list 
But if yeah. I plan ahead of time, uh, I have a to-do list ahead of time. It's also easier for me to say no. So yeah, this, true. This, yeah. this, this practice helps me to, to you know, to, to also that my calendar is also my leverage. Say that well, there's this kind of <laughs> things that you yeah. know meetings that should have been an email kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. it's easier no, for I me to say understand. that. You know, it's easier for me to say that, you know, we cannot do that because I have another thing on my calendar instead of yeah. like, okay, if I don't have anything planned, uh, what other choice do I have? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's great. So would you recommend this kind of practice to everyone? Yeah, that's that's a thing, right? <laughs> I, I feel that it's, it's it's too rigid to, 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 to a lot of people, but it doesn't hurt right. to try, I think. It's uh, mm. to have some sort of plan and, you know, keeping up with... Uh, uh, Keeping it aligned with with the research that has been done, and in multitasking, that you know, goal settings and it helps that that you know you know what to do, even in a really really micro level. Like you know what to do today, you know what to do yeah. uh, this month. You have a target for this year. You have a tar- you know what to do in, in a couple of years to come. And you know the the longer the, the time span, the the more uncertain it tends things tend to be. So you'll be more, yeah, more flexible, yeah. but for the things that you know that's really close, that that's really tangible, um, that it uh, it helps you to, you know, at least for me, what helps the most is that to get rid of the easy things uh, really early, so then have to to worry about them late, later because yeah. you know the easy things like you know sign on a paper, so that a student can graduate can be really important for them. It takes me like five <laughs> yeah. seconds, but if if it bears in, in I don't know, uh, 10, 10 more emails that are coming to me on that day, it's easy to get. Uh, yeah. You know. uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to go into some audience questions now. So I've just got the one question here, um, but I think it's really interesting because this is something that I do while I am uh, working or studying. And this person has asked, um, is listening to music while working considered multitasking? Ooh, yeah, it's uh, this is the it's a really good question. Um, it depends, of course. As a, <laughs> we we scientists, we always say that things are depends on another thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the idea about multitasking is that uh, it's it's a point where you have multiple tasks. And mm. there, there's this, I think if you, you want to separate it uh, into different levels, there's multitasking, you have multiple goals, multiple tasks. There's going distracted, getting distracted, and that you have one task, and then you orient your attention toward another another thing that mm. m- might be a task or not ma- not be a task. And there's, mo- I don't know, monotasking, doing things sequentially. So listening to music, I do that while... Uh, Funnily enough, I have different types of music of different, with different type of works I'm doing. So yeah, me too. <laughs> so I do it all the time. Uh, I I listen to music while I work. I think the idea is that if you t- you you start to get to sing along with the music, and if you attend to the music more to your work, then you're getting distracted. But right. you know. If having a music coming on your background again, uh, uh, coming back to to this arousal level thing that I that I mentioned it earlier, it helps you getting into the right amount of arousal to cap uh, to help you focus. Then it's good, and I think that's that's in most cases what uh, yeah. uh, what happened that, that that having something in the background helps you to tune into what you're doing because you cannot hear anything else, you cannot hear sudden things when you're you're hearing music. Yeah, but of course, oh. like you know, songs—they're okay. uh, easy to sing along. I tend not, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, you know, you, you, I tend not uh, not to listen to that kind of music when when I try to focus. Yeah, I try to play more um, like instrumental, like classical, orchestral kind of music instead. Yeah. And things with words, I get, I get stuck. <laughs> yeah, my brain gets too, di- I get too distracted, and I end up not doing any work, like you said. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're going into. 
the open mic section of the show now. So this is the last part of the show where the guest, Dr. Wisnu, gets to talk about pretty much anything um, that he's passionate about. It doesn't have to be related to productivity. Um, yeah. So it can be anything you want to talk about. So I'll hand it over to you now. What, what did you want to talk about? Yeah, I think it's 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 somewhat part of uh, my my work uh, in academia. It's uh, so we're trying to develop. Uh, I don't know. We call it an open science movement in Indonesia, and the idea is that we in academia we do science, and to prove to people that we do science, we write things down and publish it in in papers. <laughs> uh, yeah. and these papers, unfortunately, if you wanna if uh, people outside of academia want to read them. Do you need uh, to pay for them? For uh, to pay to read, mm. uh, you know, research. And the irony is that, of course, like we in academia, we don't we got nothing from 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 this money that people pay for to to read our papers. Uh, only oh, wow. the publishers. So yeah, it's 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 ludicrous. It's it's it's. So it doesn't go to you. It goes to the people who published the yes. like the journal so, or the article. So the journals ah. they they uh, they are managed by a publisher, uh, yeah. and the publisher you know uh, manages uh, where the the papers is being stored. The back in the days they also print the papers so that uh, yeah so that people can buy them. I don't know if this practice can uh, still still going on these days. But I know that most journals, they don't pay papers anymore. So the only thing they need to pay is typesetting and uh, storage. And you get charged like, yeah. I don't know, $15 per article. And uh, times, I don't know, hundreds and thousands and uh, tens of thousands of articles per year or per month that, that, that we uh, in, in, in academia produce. And people cannot access them. And and you yeah, know for, wow. for psychology it's not it's not that urgent but you know medical science when the COVID uh, 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 nineteen breaks uh, outbreak occurred and it's still occurring at the moment you can imagine how valuable these informations uh, yeah, become of course. Uh, and and you want everyone well not anyone with the means to do, to to do anything about it. Mm to get access into these papers and, and they don't. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. and there's this open science movement and the idea is that scientists should be able to, other scientists should be able to reproduce other scientists' work. And this could yeah. be in form of papers. Uh, you, you can replicate experiments. This could be an instrument. This could be uh, a way to uh, uh, get into certain type of participants and so on. So hmm. it's it's a whole whole array of movements and uh, with the idea of to, to to get science open to everyone. So yeah, and wow. and for me personally, I'm I'm using open source softwares for statistical analysis for doing uh, you know programming my experiments. And the idea is that I can just publish my script somewhere so that other scientists in other part of the world can also do my experiments. And this helps me a lot. Yeah. At at you know when when I start building my own lab. Because of course we don't have, we might have the equipments here, we have computers, but we don't have the programs. And if we want to use the program, we have to pay like, I don't know, thousands of dollars every yeah. year just, just, uh, just <laughs> yeah. to subscribe to the program. So yeah. with open science, people like me who might study it abroad with some cool techniques, uh, with, uh, with cool experiments, and going back to you know, places where they don't have access to those uh, application systems anymore, to actually get a, get a fighting chance to stay you know to 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 stay engaged in academia in in the level that we're supposed to be in and mm. uh, and and you know not not being compromised with the quality uh, because we don't have enough money to buy journals we don't have enough money to buy equipment so we don't have pay, uh, enough money to to subscribe for i don't know softwares that we need to to, yeah. to use to do our work. That's so interesting. Is it like somewhere that people can go? It's probably based, like mostly based in Indonesia. But is there somehow that people can kind of engage in this yeah. movement? Or so, so anyone interested in the open science movement can go into the open science framework. So that's osf.io. And then you can get all of these resources, uh, well, information and resources. There's a repository there. You can you can put your uh, your data. You can put your script. Well, anonymized data, of course. 
And mm. you can also do this pre-registration, it's called. So, and the idea is that if you want to do an experiment, you have to publish your hypothesis first. And yeah. this, okay. helps, oh, interesting. this helps researchers uh, not to claim some findings after they, 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 they do the experiment. So it's easy uh, for us. Okay, yeah. Back in the days, like we do experiment A, and then we found something we didn't find that we want, but we found something else. And then we say that, oh, this is something that we hypothesized before. <laughs> yeah. uh, but oh, you cannot do that anymore with, with this pre-registration. Yeah. And the idea is that you publish your hypothesis first, yeah. and then you do your experiments. And maybe you, 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 you cannot confirm your hypothesis, but that's a finding as well. And this helps science propagate in a really, uh, you know, in more honest, uh, open and, and, you know, uh, uh, respectable manner. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, we'll leave um, the link to that in the description below because that's definitely, uh, yeah, a movement and something that needs to be yeah, implemented. So thank you for sharing that. And that pretty much brings us to the end of our show today. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Wisnu Wiradani, for being here. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, we've had such a great time and learned so much. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's um, a lot of pleasure for me too. It's, it's, uh, this is the first time I'm doing this, I hope. It's uh, what I'm saying. It's not too technical and not too sciencey, but you know, I, I love to get to get to get people you know, yeah. into science as well. Exactly. So this is also it's a amazing. great opportunity for me. So thanks to you as well. Oh, no, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Um, for those who want to find out a bit more about you and your research and your work, is there anywhere that they can go or anything that they can look at? Or so uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm not. I'm not that active. Uh, and also re you can find most researchers on ResearchGate. Um, yeah, but, but great. I, I guess, it, you know, the more I'm doing this kind of like science uh, uh, outreach, I need to update my, my Twitter account. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. It's, it's something there that un unfortunately kind of comes with that. Um, but yeah, we'll leave the links um, to Dr. Wisnu's uh, information down below. And for those who are listening or watching, thank you so much. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks. You have been listening to Work in Progress, the personal productivity science insights podcast produced by the Life Management Science Labs. Listen to episodes from LMSL's 10 Life Management Perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or other podcasting apps on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps others find us and us grow to bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pp.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Tia Hama. Thanks for tuning in.